All right. Well, cheers. Cheers, brother. Welcome. So. Yeah, man. Who are you? Viral Patel, man. Been here 37 years in the city. Born, 37. 37. Born and raised. Born and raised in Montreal. Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, love the city. At least what it used to be anyways, right? Yeah. <laughs> I get you. And uh, tell me about your background, like where you come from, like in terms of neighborhood. Um, it's, a, it's a long story, um, but if, if I could go a little bit beyond before that, uh, my parents came here in 1972. Yep. Uh, my father specifically, he came here in 1972 when immigration opened up and uh, he actually came here with $300. That's how he got here. $300, a briefcase and a suit. That's all he had. Uh, his, his dad's best friend just told him, take that plane, go. I'll give you a plane ticket, just go. Uh, hit, my father's dad didn't even know he was going. Oh, really? He just went just like that. Um, and then he got here, and the crazy story behind that was customs and border, they didn't like, trust him to be a visitor. So they actually took a $200 deposit and his passport at customs. They held that hostage on him. So when he actually walked out of the airport, he only had $100. So that's the real struggle. And then, you know, taxis and all that stuff, whatever, you know what I mean? So like he was probably under, I don't know how many dollars by the time he got to his like friend's, you know, apartment or whatever it was. So anyhow, so long story short, so yeah, it's just, it's, it's, we've always kind of grew up in a very like working class, you know, from my parents, obviously from zero, uh, but by the time I was born, it was still very, very working class and then slowly just kind of grew the ladder um, through hard work. Pretty much, you know, from my dad's hard work, my my my, my mom's hard work, uh, nonstop. You know, they had they still don't like they still haven't stopped. My mom's retired, but my my dad still works with us in the restaurants, and he's always helping us. Cool. Yeah. And so basically, they didn't come as like a like a professional class, you know, because back in the days, they used to be okay. You're a doctor, you're a nurse, right. you're this, you're that. You right. just come in. Uh, we'll give you like the easy pass access. He just came in as so. Uh, no, actually, he was. Uh, he went to university. My parents went to uni- both went to university in India. Okay. Uh, he had an engineering degree, but you know they don't accept that yeah, here. No they don't have equivalency, right? So he, when he actually started working at a at a factory, he, his roommates told him, "Don't write that you're an engineer on your CV. You won't get the job." So he had to he had to dumb down his CV in order to get the job. And then when he got the job, you know, over time, the bosses recognized that he was well-spoken, you know, he wasn't just, you know, anybody. Mm -hmm. And his boss took him into the office and was like, hey, what's going on here? And then my dad's like, what? Uh, You seem a bit more qualified than this position. He's like, what did you do? What what, what background do you have? What what school did you go to? And my dad, you know, he didn't want to tell him. And then he told him, he's like... I know, I'm sorry, I'm lying to you, I know, like, he knew his job was done, he knew it was was over, and then his boss was super nice, recognized it, and he's like, you know what, you're getting a promotion. That's great. 15 cent promotion, 15 cents on the dollar, and that was, like, huge back in the day, right? Um, So, yeah, it's just been, it's just been, you know, that's, that's just how it goes, you know? And which neighborhood do you come from? So, um, I guess, from what I remember as a child growing up, yeah. we started in Riviera, well, for me anyways, well, I was about six, five, six years old and we were in Riviera the Prairie yeah. because he owned um, Mike's restaurant, one location. Uh, and that's as far back as I could remember. Okay. Um, so we, we spent a lot of our time there, I would say until like 95 when he, when he sold out of the business. And then uh, eventually we moved uh, in the NDG Cotonej yeah. district, uptown. Um, and then we've just pretty much been there since this whole time. Cool. Um, any entrepreneurial background in your, in your, cause I mean, starting a restaurant is a pretty major endeavor, right? It's right. one of the, I think, uh, if I remember the stats correctly, it's one of those business that if ever you get in, you're like 95% sure to fail. So, right. and then you've been here for a while. Right. Um, like, is there anything of that type in your blood? Like, in well, your- yeah, like I said, my, my dad's owned restaurants since, uh, 84. Okay. Right. So we've been in the restaurant business since since way back. Yeah. Um, and at the time, especially Mike's was really doing well between yes. 84 and let's say 90 yeah. uh, until they started rebranding. And that's when things started going downhill. And that's why he got out. Um, so we've always had that restaurant blood in our life. Mm-hmm. Plus, you know, just 
being Indian background, we just love food as always. And, you know, food's always just a, a natural thing. My, my mom till today still cooks every single day, handmade, fresh made food, you yeah. know. So it, that, that's something well, that'll just never change. Um, and then on a personal level, you know, just going back, if I think, I remember when I was in Dawson, I was doing quotables, these t-shirts where I would take like hip hop, like major hip hop lyrics and putting them on a t-shirt. So like a Biggie verse or a Jay-Z verse or whatever. And I would just try to like get that on commission through Vibes. I don't know if you remember the store yes, Vibes yeah, and yeah. all those city styles and all those stores. Yeah. And that, that was fun. But that was like, you know, that was a hobby just to sort of get my feet wet. Um, but it really, things really started coming about when after I graduated at university. Yeah. When I went to John Molson School of Business. Yeah, go for it, yeah. um, did my major in marketing, Bachelor of Commerce. And, uh, but at the time, my dad had a, he had a small dive bar. Uh, it was in Ville Saint Laurent yep. on Colby to Carrot. And uh, it, was, it was unfortunately not doing well. It was just like, and the neighborhood is really, really rough if you've ever been. Um, so we were like on the verge of bankruptcy. And, you know, I just, I just didn't want to have that happen to our family after seeing the, the difficulties of Mike's restaurant uh, going downhill as a franchise. And it was just, it was rough. Like, I remember the late night fights between my parents because of, you know, the staffing issues and, you know, and the violence over there in the north. And uh, I just told myself, look, I'm just going to jump in. I'm going to jump in the business. I'm going to fix it up from one piece, one piece, one piece, one piece. And then we'll just get out of the business. You know, we'll just sell it and just get out and just have that out of the way. Um, and that's exactly what we, what we kind of did. And I, I actually walked in with zero experience, right? I just walked in with like a school degree, you know. Um, but the, the drive was always there. You know, that, that sort of that hustle mentality was always there. And um, I literally just did that. We just sort of, you know, started off with nothing, made money, saved money, made money, saved money, and then just eventually just did a major renovation and then uh, changed it to tequila bar. But that, that's how we got to tequila bar is another crazy story too, though. Go ahead. Uh, how we got there was crazy. In, in 2008, uh, during the financial crisis, um, I was still in university. And uh, my brother and I, we took a trip to L.A. And at the time also, um, you know, here in Montreal, we only had like three Amigos, Carlos and Pepe's yeah, and whatever. So, terrible, terrible. I mean, listen, it, 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 some right. people like it, right? I mean, it, 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 to each his own, right? Yeah. Whatever. But that's all I really knew. So I didn't really make much of Mexican food, you know? Like I didn't think of anything other than the typical Tex-Mex. And uh, so when we were there, we rented, a, we rented a red Cadillac with white leather interior, like real L.A. style. And then we were just driving east side LA through the hood. And I remember my brother just telling me, he's like, yo, we gotta stop, we gotta stop. There's, there's a taco stand. And I was like, who cares? Like, who cares? You know, I don't wanna get shot. Like, you know, like I see little crackheads walking around. I'm like, no, 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 keep driving. He's like, no, 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 we gotta stop, we gotta stop. Dollar 50 tacos. He's like, all the celebrities are doing it. I'm like, one and we're done, we're out of here. Stop, had the tacos, put the sauces on and all that. And I was just like, mind blown. I was like, this is next level. Like, you know what I mean? Like, how are these guys selling it for two bucks? This is crazy. So pretty much the entire trip after that was just one taco stand after another. Really? Yeah. And, and In-N-Out Burger. You can't stop. You can't forget about In-N-Out Burger, yeah, right? Yeah. You can't forget about no that. Surprise. Yeah. So, um, but the, the whole trip was that. We didn't even go to a single restaurant. So that's where I really started getting that soft taco, you know, food experience, whatever. And then also in the same trip, we were just bar hopping on, I think it was Sunset Boulevard or Hollywood Boulevard, one of the two, uh, one of the two, I can't remember. Core, core LA. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Um, and then when we were, we were just bar hopping, we walked into this really kind of kind of like this type of looking bar, uh, but not as colorful as you see behind me, um, but the black, the black vinyls, black leathers and all that stuff. And, and the, the bartender or the, 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 bar, the bar shelves had these beautiful bottles that I'd never seen before, again. 2008, Montreal, Jose Cuevo, bang, bang. That's all you have. So I asked the bartender, I'm like, what is all that? He's like, tequila. I'm like, huh, okay, cool. And that was it. That was and it. I just walked out. I didn't even have a tequila. I was so really? young. I was so young. I, uh, I had no money. Were you right? 21? I was like 22 or something, yeah, 23, yeah. right? Yeah. Plus, we probably blew a lot of money at the other club right before, right? So we were yeah. just like, and it wasn't so busy. And, you know, we're young. We're trying to find girls and this and that, whatever. So we were just like, all right, cool. Whatever. And we just walked out. And then 
and that was a wrap. And we just, you know, come back to Montreal. If I'm not mistaken, I graduated 2010. And, and that's when I was like, okay, you know, if I'm going to jump in this bar, I'm going to fix it up. You know, let's, let's change it to tequila bar. I had contacted some private importers. They had about 10, 15 tequilas. We put 10, 15 tequilas on the rack. And, um, and at that time yet, we still didn't even have food yet. Changed, made the reno, changed it, started picking up, started picking up. This was July, 2011, started picking up, but I really wanted food. I really wanted that to become something because I remember at the time, especially bars were known for being bars. Yeah. The whole gastro pub experience was not there yet here in Montreal. And that's something I really wanted to bring. I wanted to make sure that we could, we could bring good food into a bar and not just have pub food. Yeah. You know what I mean? So in the location of Villasenor, there was a lot of Mexicans. I tried to get a Mexican chef, um, but they just weren't coming through. Uh, but we still had a lot of Mexican clientele. So my kitchen was in the back. I, 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 I set up a bunch of dudes by the bar. I'm like, hey, we got a chef in the back. We're going to pull out some new food. We just want you to taste and we want you to let, you know, let, tell us how it is, yeah. you know? Feedback. Yeah. Meanwhile, it was me in the kitchen. Right? I'm straight lying with these guys. I was like, there's a Mexican in the kitchen, right? Because that's, that's how you get the green pass, right? Wait, 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 wait. Before I get that, how, how did you learn those recipes? Like, how, how did you... So again, just my mom uh, taught me basics, cook, you know, kitchen basics. Yeah. And there's a lot of spices that are interconnected between uh, Mexican cuisine and Indian cuisine. Mm -hmm. Obviously not to the full degree, but there's still a lot. And obviously, I did a lot of my own research and stuff like that, just yeah. watching videos. Or and I also went to Mexico, uh, got some recipes from there from some some like local guys. Um, and so I just kind of put it together, and then started shooting out food. And all the guys by the bar were like, "Oh yeah, está muy bien, muy bien, muy bien," you know, like tell the tell the chef, you know, chapeau and all that stuff, you know. And I'm like, "All right, cool, I got some." I'm like, and so, and that's how it's just started. And we just started putting together some plates, some tacos, some quesadillas, some burritos, you know, and then just putting my little twist on it. And then it just like, it just started going crazy. Like, because no one was doing it yeah. here in Montreal. It was just us and maybe one of the restaurant. And it just started going crazy where people from like Chateau Guy were coming to Ville Saint Laurent. Yeah. Hampstead was coming to Ville Saint Laurent. Like, yeah. like I literally turned this like basement bar into a destination setting, which was nuts. You know, and then and then throwing the music a year later, I just started DJing because I used to DJ night from back in the day. I and and that's another funny story because I bought turntables for the bar, thinking that people still use turntables, and they don't even use turntables anymore. <laughs> I'm like, oh man! So I just bought, I just spent all this money on turntables and, and the whole thing, and like no one's even using it. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, you know what? Let let me let me do it. Let me let me see what I what I could do. And then I started doing that, and then it just started going crazy. We called it Funky Fresh Fridays, old school hip hop. R&B, dance hall, all that. And now we started getting more people. And it's just, it just the snowball effect went crazy. And it was just something that you would have never expected in Ville Saint Laurent in the basement on the corner to carry Cobra 2 where people are getting shot, literally. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and and it, it was it's something, it, it, it was wild. But going back to like Tequila Bar, it's Ville Saint Laurent. Right. And right, right now we're in Saint Henry. And there's a parallel between both neighborhoods, right? It used to be a really rough place here. That's right. Like a very rough place. I think I remember coming here in 20, 2008, 2010. It was, it was, it was rough. It, it was rough. It Absolutely. Was um, what made you decide to move from there to here? Like, Good question. In 2008, uh, when I was in university at the time, I was, when I, before I got into business school, I had to do some extra credit courses. Yep. And one of them happened to be urban planning. Yep. Right. My professor was really good. Um, and it's exactly 2008, actually. And he had told us about St. Henry, Griffintown, the Sudwest, and how it's going to be the next biggest thing in Montreal. We had to literally do a foot tour of the area. We had to watch a play at the Centaur Theater that, that, that pretty much reflected on the gentrification of this neighborhood. Um, so, and I, was, I think it was 2008 also that Joe Beef had just opened up, yes. if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I could be wrong, but if I'm not mistaken. It was, it was around that time. It was, it's at least 10 years old. So yeah, yeah. It was around that time. Um, and I don't think I even knew about Joe Beef at that time either. I was so young, but, um, but I saw it coming and I told myself, if we're going to open a business and invest our life, it has to be in an area that's upcoming where, you know, we could get that good rent prices and all that stuff because you need that in a restaurant. Yeah. 
you know, rent is the most rent and salaries are the two most important things yeah. in order to survive. So that that's how that started pretty much. Okay, so that, yeah. that, that's what made you start because of the all the studies you made in school and right. like whatever you saw the demographic right. and this neighborhood actually changed. Like if people don't know tremendously in the last ten years, right. it went from like probably the armpit of Montreal to like one of the the, the, the one of the best places to live. Exactly, uh, that's right. In terms of going out, having a restaurant, having a meal, and yeah. going in the city. Because Saint Catherine died. Right. Meanwhile, Saint Laurent also died in the right. Saint Laurent, right. the main boulevard, right. in Sherbrooke. Right. Also, slowed down much right. why exactly. Right. And also, I knew that Saint Henry would remain a residential area, yeah. nonetheless. And my style of a business, even from back in the Ville Saint Laurent days, mm -hmm. was always about making it a home for people. Like if you even like if I know the cameras don't see everything, but when you're sitting here, especially with the staff and the vibe. People will come here at like five and they'll leave at three in the morning. Like they don't even realize. It's a hangout. Yeah, like you just don't realize. It's just comfortable like that. The wooden ceilings that, you know, you just feel at home. So I've always wanted to make sure that wherever we open up, it would be somewhere where it would be home to people and not just, you know, treating people like a number, you know? So yeah, that's what it is. Meanwhile, I know you told me you have a family now. Right. Uh, three year old son, wife, yeah. Cool. Yep. And basically through that time that you developed, and transition from Saint Laurent to Saint Henry, right. you had a family and all that fun stuff, right? Uh, kind of. Uh, when we opened up here in 2015, mm -hmm. so uh, got married just around right, right there, um, and then my my son was born in 2018. Yeah. So it was like it was like one after another, one after, yeah. one after another. It was like my wife's like, "When are you putting the ring on my finger? You're about to open a business. Put a ring on yeah, my finger. Secure, secure the business and secure my business. Yeah. Secure yeah. Well, you know what? She secures me. So she's actually, uh, we met at my first location. She was the first person my father hired. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. She was the first person my father hired. And um, funny enough, when I jumped in the business, she hated my guts. Why? Because I'm the new guy in town, right? Like, I'm the new guy. I have to put order. I have to set the rules and da 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 She hated me. She wanted, she actually quit. And she quit, and then I was like, you know what? Because of all the great work you did, let me throw you a party. So, and then I think from there, she's like, you know what? He's actually a good person. And then she stuck around and stuck around, and we just like we just made the business together so you from have, there. You have pers persuasion skills, right? Um, you have to. Yeah. You have to in this business. You know what I mean? So, but uh, it's crazy. She she still she still works here, even uh, as a mother. She still works here. She creates all the cocktails here. Um, uh, you know, we work together on that. She's, she's a big, big part of the business for sure. Cool. For sure, yeah. Hey, well, it's any business that you have with your family. I mean, any business you have anyways involves your family. I've never seen a business that's like completely detached from right. who the owner is. Right. right. It's, it's, it, this is one of your ch children too, right? This that's is, right. This is your blood. This is, you've been there for more than a decade. Right. Doing this. This is part of you, right? So right. It, it, uh, I mean, even my own child has been in my studio as right. help. Not, not she's three years old too but right. she held reflectors <laughs> right you, <laughs> at, 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 you gotta start them young you gotta start, early, you right? gotta start them young yeah, yeah. And, and then just to parallel with your father also right? right we saw that he started his business back in 84 like the, the year you were born right and here you are so right. owning a restaurant right right that, that impacts your yeah uh, yeah it was uh it was it was not easy it's not easy at all a lot of hard work and then you know you just with everything going on today, you just it's, you just kind of question things, you know, because you just want to know whether or not if it was worth it or not. You know what I mean? Because being closed is not fun. I could assure you that being closed for what? That, what is it for us? The third time now? I think the third or fourth for the uh, restaurants. Fourth. I mean, who's counting? Yeah, who's counting? Yeah, who's yeah. counting? Yeah. Right? You count the shots, but not. Uh, the yeah, I mean, it's it's bad. It's bad that we're not counting, though. You know, everyone's become so complacent on this. Yeah, you know, we're just like, oh yeah, sure, another lockdown. Yeah, curfew. Ah, okay, cool. No, it's not cool. Yeah, it, it, you know, yeah. like yeah. so. Understand. It's wild. I mean, like just the idea of complacency to me is just out of out of my like, control. It's just is is out of control because like, as a business owner, you cannot get complacent, right? You have to take risks. You have to do that. That's the whole point of being a business owner. And momentum, is, right? Is is, is, is is everything. Is everything. Yeah. Is everything. Yeah. I mean, what are we doing? You know staying at home and just continuously yeah we'll just do takeout delivery again you know yeah. it's like if i told you uh well you you have a camera in your hand you could just start doing wedding photos yeah no <laughs> no <laughs> exactly that's my point right yeah it's like they think it's so simple it's like no uh 
there's a reason why Domino's is Domino's and Domino's is not Domino's nightclub. Yeah. Right? Domino's does take out delivery. That's what they specialize in. You know? And there's a social element to it, to your business. Oh, 100%. Uh, even said, you said people come here at 5 p.m. After, right after work, basically, and, right. and then hang out until 3 a.m. Right. It's a hangout, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's how human evolve. Is, right. uh, we evolve in groups and then right. we hang out and we're close to each other. Right. And yeah, we have those interventions that, uh, that close. So it's a good segue, I think, from whatever you just said to the beginning of all of this madness, right? So March 2020. Right. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, we closed on the 15th or the 15th. 15th? Yeah. Right, 15th. Like, how were you doing before uh, all the closures? Like, I mean, we were doing just pretty much like everyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, things were all right. Things were okay. Um, you know, I mean, it was just the, the general, you know, like, yeah. we knew what the busy months were. We knew what the quiet, quiet months were. We knew how to staff situations. We knew how to, you know, handle those types of situations. Um, I think 2018, was a really good year, if I'm not mistaken. If I'm not, uh, I got to double check, but I think that was a very, very good year. Uh, so everything was fine, you know? No one, no one saw any of this coming. Um, but when 2020, when March 15, 2020 hit, and everyone kind of just hibernated, it was like alarms ringing, right? Like you just don't know what to do, you don't know what to expect. Um, fortunately for me, I was actually doing private culinary classes here in the restaurant. Perfect. Yeah, for like about, about five months on Sundays right before, uh, and it ended in February, yeah. I think early February. Um, and my goal was to redefine the menu, make it better, make the place better, all that type of stuff. Um, so my chef, great chef, uh, Melinda, Melinda Gorman, who was the sous chef at Pastel, um, phenomenal, she really like, drilled it into me how to do things properly and I learned so much and then again I'm not saying luckily but COVID hit everything shut down we my myself and my my sous chef here at tequila bar we just what came in the restaurant cleaned up the entire kitchen like unscrewed all the appliances everything like from top zero to 100 okay. and then just did a full cleaning and then we opened up takeout orders but we had to really dumb down the menu because it was just me and him yeah so literally getting the phone calls i was taking the phone calls punching in the order going to the kitchen helping him cook it help him pack it like like that you know like real like just two-person job and then and people will come in and, and it's a takeout right? yeah, yeah 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 yeah. Okay, okay. i think we set up like tables right by the front door so no one could actually walk in we would just put the bags there and, and whatever do the payments and all that so it was just us two and then eventually it started rolling a little bit more so I got one of my other cooks who I unfortunately had to lay off, bring them in. And so they started doing their thing. I would still help out with, you know, punching in orders. But my real mandate for myself was to create the new menu. That was the goal. And one thing at a time, one step at a time, that's what we were doing. And we, we just started mastering little recipes here or there, whatever. And then by the time we were allowed to actually reopen our dining hall with capacity issues or whatever, we opened up with the new menu, with the... So that was the entire goal. Whenever you want to redesign the right. entire, it was when you, you will, you'll be able to open, that's you right. can actually have a fully fledged, full fleshed out menu right. that's available to, right. your customers, right. to your customers. Right? That's right. Okay. And again, we kept a lot of the classics. We just wanted to make sure things got better. We wanted to, make, yeah, exactly evolve because we, it, it, we were due at that time. You yeah. know what I mean? So it was, it was time for it. Uh, I think a lot of people like what we're doing uh, obviously you're gonna you can't please everybody that's just the name of the game yeah. you know some people come here for one thing all the time and mm -hmm. you just can't please that person obviously but uh from what we've seen over time it's 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 been very beneficial so as a true entrepreneur you always try to take negative situations absolutely. and try to absolutely to capitalize on them absolutely and then, and then to, to go which is i think the nature of anyone that's surviving especially you i've seen your father going through struggles and you probably saw what happened whenever of you make changes that are not, um, how can I say this politely? Uh, not, not optimal for, for the business, like my yeah. back in the 90s. And, right. Yeah. I mean, you look, you know, as I wasn't the only one, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you were not taking advantage of the COVID crisis, what were for, you doing? For, for your restaurant, yeah. For any, any industry. Yeah. Everyone was doing it. Mm -hmm. and the strip clubs were doing it. <laughs> kidding me? Like... <laughs> Charging extra just to go in the booth? Like, come on, man. Yeah. 
Everyone was doing it. So, you know, this is what it is. It's 2020, 2021. Like, well, internet's out there. We know what to do. Like, so, you know, that's what it is. I mean, again, there's a lot of people, older generations that didn't, you know, they got left behind. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate. That's just sort of the older mentality. But you have to evolve with the situations. Yeah. The problem now has become the fact that we continue to adapt to the new order rather than just saying no. It's enough. That's the problem. We've done enough. Every time they threw us a curveball, we took, we took another way out. And we was like, all right, cool, we'll just do this. We'll do that. We'll do this. It's enough of that. You know what I mean? So that, that's sort of, I think, where a lot of people feel right now. That's where a lot of people stand. And I can see in the frustrations of a lot of restaurant owners and, and people. I go to my friend's, res- my, uh, my friend's uh, pizza restaurant, and it's just him. It's literally just him in the kitchen doing everything again and i could see the frustrations um when then one guy comes in later to help or whatever you know what i mean but it's like we're back at square one again yeah it's like starting all over again that's right and 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 momentum it's like you said yeah. momentum. momentum it's hard to get that momentum yeah, momentum is critical it's literally the thing that keeps you alive because i mean at some point you're tired you don't want to you don't want to be here you, you no. want to i mean you have this young son right you right. want to spend time with him but you have this also that provides for your family. So. Of course. Yeah, I mean, you can't, let, you can't just let it go, right? Yeah. And everyone's in different situations. Mm-hmm. Uh, last year, I, I would imagine, I don't know, I can't speak for everyone, so I won't say for everyone, but yeah. we had to take out a lot of a debt. We had to take out loans. Uh, you know, we had to do all that in order to stay alive. I didn't take a paycheck for a year and a half. A year and a half. Just to make sure my employees got paid, just to make sure the suppliers got paid, just to make sure that the rent got paid. A year and a half. The tips that were made during the takeout delivery all went back to the restaurant in order to pay the salaries, et cetera, et cetera. You know? Um, and here we are again. Like, you know? When does it stop? Right? So it's, it's, it's wild. Like, the thing is, unfortunately, I knew this was coming. I was talking to my chef, my sous chef, when we were doing takeout delivery. I'm like, they're going to lock us down come Christmas, January, whatever, when it gets cold. When it's so cold, people don't want to go out to protest. You know, they're going to lock us up. I'm like, and when they do, we're going to take a month off. Screw it. Yeah. Maybe two. We'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll enjoy our life. So you didn't decide to do whatever you did in wave one, which is to open limited orders and... You... Uh, wait, so wait, are you, are you referring to the last reopening? Yeah, the last. So if I remember correctly, you right. said March... You decided to revamp your menu and then right. open as a delivery takeout slash restaurant, right? In the beginning, yes. Beginning, yeah. In the beginning, and, and yes. And then now we're in January 2022. Right. They lost it down again in very late December. Right. And you just decided, you know what, we're done. We're not, uh, we're not doing that takeout thing again. For now, For now. right? Yeah. Like, I'm just, I just want to take a break. Mm-hmm. I just want to spend some time with my family, my kid. Again, like I've said it before, like I didn't have a chance to hang out with him since we reopened on June 9th, 2021. Um, I, I really didn't have a chance to hang out with him too much because labor shortages. Uh, I was literally cooking, serving the food. Uh, after, after my kitchen shift, I would take off the apron, start bartending, you know, all that thing. Like, it was just nonstop, nonstop. And, and I'm very hands-on. I, I, and I, I like being hands-on. It's not like I don't. Like, I, I enjoy it. So, um, you know, it's just, it's just been nonstop. So I'm just trying to take a little break as I think as a lot of restaurant owners deserve it after after all this. So, you know. Yeah. So we spoke about the history, like what happened early on. Um, I want to know, and this is, I mean, right. share as much as you want. Sure, go ahead. How much have you lost since, and, and not even in terms of like you yourself alone, right? I, right. I mean, there's been a lot of consequences, but employees, stuff like that. How, oh. like, how, how much wow. have you? Uh, you know, in monetary, from let's say March 2020 to June 2021, yeah. I would say at least 70,000, at least. But at a certain point, I just stopped counting because if I keep counting, it's just like you lose your mind, lose your mind right? Um, but at least, I would say at least 70,000. Um, and as much as that hurts, you know, you, when you're a young entrepreneur, you're like, you know, don't worry, we'll, we'll find a way, we'll find a way, we'll figure it out. But there's certain things that you lose that you just can't get back. Um, some of your very loyal staff members, um, you know, that's probably the 
some of the most heartbreaking stuff. And not in any bad way. They had to leave because they had to do what they had to do, yeah, right? Yeah. Like they, they pivoted into other industries um, that were more secure and so on and so forth. And, and I totally get it. Um, and I know it was rough to see someone like Jess leave us and, you know, and, and Jadlyn leave us. You know, she, it, was, it was rough, but hey, do what you got to do. And, uh, and I totally support it 100%. Um, so that was, I think as much as the money hurts, there's no question. Um, but it's just the whole dynamic together that hurts mm -hmm. you know and and the fact that they just continue to throw you crumbs you know recently they announced what the workers benefit is what three hundred dollars a week and then it's tax you only get 270 275 who how are you gonna do that yeah. who's gonna do that Who's li who lives in montreal yeah like uh, the rent you know how crazy the rent is these days yeah, like with the amount of inflation on top of it and the, the housing prices going through the roof you know, all the money they printed, and it's like, come on, man. Like, you can't be expecting people to survive off 275 a week. You pretty much want people to join the corporate world. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, you're forcing them. You're forcing them to join the corporate world, yeah. or the government world, or whichever world that still is open, mm -hmm. pretty much at this point, right? Not the small middle class businesses. That's what it is. And that's the hard part. My wife herself took on a job at Lowe's in the supply chain division. Because she knew, and she, was, she used to be a personal trainer. She had clients. But because of what's going on right now, industry got messed up, losing a lot of clients, and you know, fear, fear, fear. And um, she decided to go with Lowe's because it was something that, you know, it's okay with the family life, with the kid, nine to five, a, a proper salary, benefits, so on and so forth, and working from home. Therefore, if there's another lockdown, we can, we can survive even if the restaurant gets closed down. Because don't forget, she was, in the re she was in the gym industry, I was in the restaurant industry, both of us got stopped. Nuclear bomb. The nuclear bomb, <laughs> that's right, <laughs> right? So um, she had to do what she had to do. So I totally, you know, like that's, it's, 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 they're making it extremely difficult right now for anyone who's in our industry to survive. Um, and again, they're just throwing us crumbs. And the fact that the, so, the people who are, you know, so caring about the community, forget about us. It's like, what about us? Can we eat? Right? Yeah. If I open up my doors right now and then people are going to backlash me and, and, and hate on me, this and that. Don't come. Yeah. Just don't come. Yeah. I don't mind. You don't, you don't have to be that person, right? You don't have to come. You don't, you, exactly. You, you have, have a choice. Yeah, yeah. The beauty of private enterprise is the fact that you always have a choice. You will always have a choice. With government, you never have a choice. Yeah. It's do this or else, yeah. whatever it may be. The big stick. I'm telling the people right now, you want to come to Tequila Bar if I open my doors, whenever that may be, I'm warning everyone, it's enter at your own risk. Now you have a choice. So I don't see what's wrong with that. Uh, you know, it may go against certain people's ideals and ideologies, sure. No problem. But at least I'm telling you the truth and I'm not lying to you like everyone else is. Yeah. And in terms of, I know you're a family man, so I'm, I'm talking father to father here. Right. What was the impact of, in, the, in, your, in your mesh, right? Because wife, kid, I mean, right. it, it's, it's, a, it's an ecosystem you build for right. yourself, right? And then you want to go back home to it and you want to enjoy it. Is there, has there been any impact on your family life? in terms of stress? I think you told me your parents used to fight. Uh, well, my parents used to fight just because of the, the, the situation, the struggle that was arising, especially at the time. Um, I'm so fortunate that my wife is just like me, if not more, uh, you know, strict about things and sees the same vision that I have. And that's so important. Yeah. in a partnership, in any partnership, whether it be marriage, business, so on and so forth. Yeah. Vision is the most important thing. Yeah. And we see things so clearly. Um, so when all this was happening, we were just like, no, we're not gonna follow the rules. No, we have to, we have to be us. We cannot just conform to the narrative. Um, and we're gonna do what we believe is right. Whether or not we will get fines or closures or be shamed in the media or whatnot. We said we were gonna do what we're gonna do to uphold our beliefs. You can shame me for that if you want, but I don't see what's wrong with that. In fact, I don't, I don't even have a problem with 
people who think the opposite of me, but who actually believe in it. I don't, I don't have a problem with them because they really believe that and they're going to stand up for that and that, that's fine. Who I do have a problem with are people in the middle who are being complacent, who know what's going on is wrong or think it's wrong, yet they're still just playing along. That's a problem. People who are willfully conforming to the new, to the new, new. But you said, so you try to adapt, right? And it's fine. And, and right. your, your wife has helped you shape that, that vision. And right. we have to remember that last year in summer, the Vax Passport right. started. Right. Um, I personally was, I made a commitment to myself that I wouldn't spend money in the place that asked me for a Vax Passport. That's right. Because I just found it egregious. Right. Um, I agree. Hundred percent. How did you react to that? Oh, I didn't even. I wasn't even asking, in the beginning. Uh, we weren't asking at all. We were probably the only ones that was like, because, you know, people. I know a lot of restaurants were faking it, um, but I believe that if you're faking it, you're still enabling it, right? And I'm just, again, I want to be very clear about something so important. I'm not anti-vax. Uh, uh, I'm pro-choice. One hundred percent. Everyone should have the right to make their own choices. Um, I want to be very clear on that. Um, I just, in terms of the Vax Pass, a Vax Pass is only deemed effective if it reduces or stops transmission, which clearly, after the results of what we've just seen, has not happened. I knew this was going to happen, and that's why I was against it, because I knew it was not going to reduce transmission. Um, so therefore, and, and, and I, I remember there's, there's, a, there's a whole article about it, I think even CB, TV News even posted this article about the effectiveness of a passport and, and therefore if it's not effective, it needs to be questioned and removed altogether. Yeah. Uh, you, could, you could go check it, you Google it, Wh- whoever wants to Google it, Google it, it's out there. Um, so f- to me, that was the, a, a big defining point. And all we're doing is we're segregating people at that point, right? This is segregation. Segregation 2.0. Yeah. Like, what are we doing here? Modern. Right. Modern. That's what I'm saying. 2.0, yeah, right? Modern. 3.0, however you want to call it. Yeah. So I was against it totally. I was not even checking. Uh, I know clients got upset and so on. A, a very small percentage, by the way. A very small percentage of people got upset about it. Um, so I just, I just didn't think it was right. Um, and I was, and, and, and you know, you know what's, what was interesting? I had some clients come in and they were like, hey, like we noticed like you didn't check it and you're not wearing a mask and so on and so forth. And like, you know, my kids are not vaccinated and like, like where do you stand on the picture? And I, and, I, and, I, and I literally told them pretty much a lot of the things that we spoke about today about how as a restaurant industry, we've been demonized for so long, how, you know, we're still in that boat and and the beauty of it was the conversation. Having a conversation resulted in that gentleman saying, you know what, I understand what you're saying. I respect what you're saying. But just for my family, I will have to leave. But I totally get you. And I want to just do whatever I can to protect my family. And he even left us a, like a $10 tip without even sitting. He didn't even have a drink or nothing. He so left he us a tip. Buy anything? He didn't buy anything. He still left us a tip out of respect. But that's what we need. We need to have a conversation with people on the other side and try to come back to the center because right now the division is clear. People have gone too left, people have gone too right. We need to find a way to come together, whatever it may be, and stop the demonization and stop the shame game. It's enough. And it's, go ahead. All right, so the Vax Passport in our, in our view of the world that right. didn't work, right? Because again, they shut us down again. Right. And, and if that's not enough proof that it didn't work, mm-hmm. um, I mean, what else do you need, right? But the government said, okay, we'll help you out. We'll give you loans. We'll give you uh, subsidiaries. We'll, 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 we'll uh, there's a CERB, the CERB. That's for the, that's f- uh, for the employee. Uh, employee. Right. Yeah. And then there was the rent. Protection. There was, that's right. That was the CERS. Yeah. And then what else? Um, because I know in terms of restaurant, I mean, right. you, I mean, it's, Money is your life and blood. Like right. Life. So, so like I was, as a, I don't know if I mentioned before, but obviously the rent and salaries are the two most biggest expenses yeah. in a restaurant. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at the time, last curfew, all we were allowed to do was take out delivery. Mm-hmm. 
Uber and them, they charge crazy prices, you know, yeah. percentage, commission, so on and so forth, but you do what you got to do. Um, so naturally, we had to take out loans in order to survive. Um, one, one of them being through the bank, which was the uh, SIBA, if, if I'm not mistaken, is what it was called. Yeah. 40,000, 60,000, 20,000 would get uh, forgiven. And then the other one was the, uh, the Quebec-based loan. Um, you know, depending on your situation, it could be 50,000, 25,000, 75,000, whatever it was. Now, the, the, I was okay with the bank one, but I was always skeptical about the Quebec one. So just to go back, yeah. the, the bank one, was it through the federal, I think? Well, the federal printed the money, and then they, and then they you know, yeah, they back to the bank. that's right, Charter. just like 2008. Okay. It was like the same pretty much procedure, right? Um, the, the Quebec one was the, the, the one I was just skeptical about, okay. right? Um, so what they said was, we'll give you the money, but 90% of it would be forgiven based on overhead costs like insurance and, you know, the various specific... Uh, overhead okay. costs. So they had a list of costs that That's right. was included into that That's right. loan. Right. Okay. So like inventory wouldn't be one of them, right? It would just be like basic overhead costs. Um, they said 90% would be forgiven. So obviously everyone had to take it or everyone or many people took it. I took it obviously. Um, and then you had to renew it every so often uh, just because they kept delaying when you're supposed to pay it back. And they also asked that whatever was not forgiven would be at a 3% interest rate, yeah. which I find interesting because like, you're shutting us down. Why are we paying interest, right? It's like, I didn't ask to be shut down. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird position. To right, yeah. it should be 0% interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, I would rather be open. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyhow, whatever. And then just recently, and I have the paperwork to prove it, just recently, on the paperwork, the renewal of this loan says, that if you have received any public health order infractions, the percent forgiven will be dependent on that. So they give you money. They basically they give you a lifeline. Right. Saying if ever you don't play by our rules, correct, you get penalized. Correct. With our own actions. Correct. Sounds like the credit score system, doesn't it? Sounds like a mafia. <laughs> <laughs> As we already know. Yeah. Sounds like a mafia. Because I mean, the mafia model is pretty much. Hey, we'll give you protection. Right. We'll come in, right. we'll give us some, some money. Right. But if you don't give us protection, right. then you lost. Something's going to happen. So those programs that the government basically put on the table right. comes with a leash and then they can yank it back because, again, I'll repeat myself, but the government controls the time they can be open. Can, can the time can you can close because here we have to close at 3 p.m. because you can't sell alcohol after a certain law. 3 a.m. That's uh, 3 right. Sorry, right, right, 3 a.m. Right. Yeah, 3 a.m. Sorry. Um, this provides you the alcohol that you actually sell because mm -hmm. there's no, you can do private import of course but it's always well, that's always through the SAQ. It's always, it's always through SAQ, government the that's SAQ, right which is the government so that's right it's like they they are coming into so many so many areas of your life that's right how do you feel as a business about that is it is it uh constraining um like just like let's put COVID aside right? right is it a constraint to have that many interventions or it's well of course i mean you're being controlled in every single angle of your life mm -hmm. Right, yeah, there's. I believe in free markets. Um, they're gonna control alcohol. I mean, it's ridiculous how much they. Con there's no need for it, you know. Um, the private import companies that I deal with tell me all the time how much of a struggle it is for them in order to put their products on the shelf. Um, it's always a struggle because there's so much bureaucracy and red tape behind it all. Um, no one knows that. Um, I mean, certain bottles and certain prices of certain products are so jacked up. It's crazy. It's insane. I think the only thing that SQ does properly is wine. I think the prices of wine are pretty good. Yeah. Um, but in terms of everything else, it's, it's crazy. What do you see in the future in terms of your business? Like, do you, what do you think is going to happen? Like, let's say we, let, let's say, let's hope we get past all of this. Like, what's, what do you think is going to happen? What's well, I've, 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 I've said this a long time ago, uh, especially with the beginning of COVID. Uh, and the way things are rolling out right now okay. is that restaurants and, 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 and also don't forget inflation. Yeah. Inflation is a really big factor uh, because in order for restaurants to keep up, they have to jack up their prices. There's no questions. Changes. For example, I'll give you a very simple example. Canola oil, when I was buying it at Costco before, before the prices got, went up, was about 16, I think $17 for a four liter jug. If you go right now, it's $45. 
That's just canola oil. That's just canola oil. Think about all the fried chicken spots that open up. Yeah. Think about them. Yeah. Think about what kind of struggle they're going through. Yeah. So prices are going to go up. Yeah. And then what ends up happening is you have a disparity. You're going to have restaurants that are only going to cater to the rich and restaurants that are only going to cater to the poor. And that middle is gone. Yeah. Unless you pivot. Unless you change your menu. Unless you have the necessary skills to do those things. So you, people are going to have to adapt. just depends which route you want to take. But that middle ground is getting depleted, naturally. And we don't have a choice. We don't want to do this. We don't want to, I don't, I don't like increasing my prices. I don't want to do that. How much, how much am I going to be able to charge for tacos, right? And much less pretty expensive already. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's, just, it's just the natural, it's just the way business works. So basically, if I understand, if I have to say, like, like some like summarize everything you just said is you think the middle middle class restaurant is going to disappear so anything that's like affordable for a regular couple that makes regular income right mm -hmm. so nothing mm -hmm. astronomical will mm -hmm. basically evaporate and then it's going to be just like the higher 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 end right restaurants that people don't really care if it just moves by 50 bucks or not i mean they still go and it doesn't really change their right. purchasing power right and then we're going to be left with the Basically, the corporation is going like the mega corporation. You're going to have La Belle Province, and you're going to have La Belle Belle Province. Yeah, yeah. That's all you're going to have. Yeah. That's all you're going to have. have. Yeah. Yeah. Le chien chaud et les saucisses. Yeah. That's what you're going to have. Yeah. Depressing. And <laughs> so, do you think you'll make it? I will, you know, there's something I keep telling my wife. Is that we always find a way. We always have. Because... And the true testament was my location in Bilsi Malam. Because we literally did the impossible and we made it possible. There was no, I, I, I honestly don't know any entrepreneur here in Montreal, even the best of the best, who would have, if I said, hey, here's a challenge, here's this location, turn into something. I don't think anyone would have taken that challenge. No one. Not even, I'm telling you. So, the fact that we were able to do that, the fact that we were able to come to St. Henry even on an extremely tight budget um, and made it happen, the fact that we survived so far and paid off a lot of our debts in the last six months, I think I will be okay. I'll find a way. Whatever the case is, you know what I'm saying. I, I I know how to handle situations. I know how to adapt. But, but to not so sorry, not to be unfair, but right. you had a lot of advantage because you had a lot of um, a lot of experience right. with like with turns around, turn mm -hmm. around, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think other restaurants have the same pedigree. I, as I you. agree. Any anyone that you know, like because uh, you probably are connected with the network of restaurants, right? right? Anyone that you know that that lost or, or, or stopped? Or one, of the, one of the saddest stories for me, especially because I grew up, you know, partying a lot, was the uh, Tokyo nightclub. Yeah, so yeah. That one was, I think it was the one that hurt me the most because I knew everyone. Uh, Stacy was still my favorite, uh, godmother of my brother's child. Oh, wow. uh, she's the greatest. Uh, Jericho, the whole goon squad, you know, everybody, Trevor and all those guys. Uh, like I was there every Sunday, you know, and that place is literally an establishment here in Montreal. If you know, you know, yeah. you know, you know, you know, and they were literally just holding on as long as they could, hoping that things would turn around. And I, and they just, you know, they had to make, they had to make an executive decision as everyone had to. Um, and that was, I think the most heartbreaking one for me, just because I kind of grew up in there. You know what I mean? But I mean, there's so many other places too, right? And I'm sure, I'm sure everyone has a story. But I think that one was the toughest because just because there was such an establishment, and I know if things were okay right now, they would still do extremely well, you know. Um, even the security team uh, from Platinum Security, Mo, and like, he's still around. Obviously, he was doing our security here, um, and it's just heartbreaking. It's just heartbreaking to see that. Um, I wish, I wish they were still around. I, I would go there. I remember I would go there when I was like, not too, a couple of years ago, you know, the oldest guy in the club. <laughs> well, Tokyo is like, a, that's where you go when you don't want to be, you want to be in a party, but not too in a party. It was like this 
happy middle ground between two yeah. places. And it right. was, I mean, even if you didn't like Tokyo that much, you would still go because it's still a great place to go in general. So Always great place. Yeah, yeah. It's Best a, vibes. That's a good thing. It was a great and R and B music. And oh, all yeah. of it. The uh, music was always great. Yeah, always, always great. great. Yeah, Beyonce too. Yeah. Um, but so that's one casualty, and I'm sure there's right. There's so many, many more. Of course, so many more. there's so many more. And that's just restaurants, right? I mean, well, that was a nightclub. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, definitely. I mean, again, people also just got tired. You know, people. I, I know a Grumman Grumman uh, seventy eight. They just they threw in the flag. Um, Are they closed? Yeah. Oh, that sure. was that was last year. Grooming through in the flag, they they were I know tired, and is is I, I feel like especially this time around this with this new curfew and with what's going on, I feel like so many more are going to throw in the flag, because again, don't forget the amount of debt that people have taken, um, and then how do you get out of that debt, right? So, I think this one's going to be the real game changer here. That that I think so. You think the last one that we had is like the the breaking point for a lot of businesses moving forward in 2022 and beyond. Because, right. Yeah. I, I, I like to help people that are watching this and maybe give them a message of hope. From your perspective, from, right. like, from a restaurant, like, like businessman, from entrepreneur, from a restauranter, right. from someone that has been seeing and have survived through all these entire cycles and right. too many of them are many old cycles, what can we do in order to progress? I mean, I mean I'm tired. Of the curfews, I'm tired of. Uh, I'm tired of not going to a restaurant, right. and I, I, I'd like to give money to those businesses, but right. I don't feel good about it because right. I'm, I feel like I'm encouraging a very bad behavior. Right. What can people do to one support you and also move past this? I think there's, I, I think there's two things that we can do. Yeah. Okay. Number one, I, the, I think the most important message right now, well, th- something we need to look at first is the patterns, yeah. right? We've complied. Yeah. Where has it led us? Right? Curfews. Or well, whatever. Yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah. for someone to think about, yeah. right? Yeah. Everything, every time we have did what they've asked us to do, including myself, I'm not going to say, you know, I did also the necessary things they asked us to do. What happened? What was the result? Okay, cool. Then why not try to do the opposite? In other words, not comply, right? I think... It's important to say, hey, you know what? Let's just take a step back here. Let's think about this. What happens if we don't comply? Maybe their whole narrative falls apart in any of their demands, that is. Another thing I really think we should be doing is every industry, restaurants, gyms, yoga studios, uh, anyone else suffering, and eventually it'll happen maybe in your own industry. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Like, don't think it's just restaurant gyms. No. We're the scapegoats right now. Yeah. In every political crisis, there's a scapegoat. We're, we happen to be the ones right now. But don't wait for it to happen to you. So therefore, I believe that if every industry sort of gets together, decentralized, and creates a, uni- a united front against this in a mass, no- mass non-compliance form, we have a chance. It's very important. But to just, I don't believe in ideologies. I don't believe in if everyone would, if everyone could, if everyone should. I believe in one could turn into two, two turns into four, eight, 16, 32, et cetera. That's what I believe in. Something that's a bit more realistic. But it starts with one. And I think that's what's important. I think that's the message that needs to be sent. There was only one Rosa Parks. It started with one. Yeah. There was only Martin Luther King. There was only one Gandhi. Gandhi. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It was always one. Yeah. But then what happened after it became a movement. So it's important that we, in each of our industries, need to come together, unite, put this, the division aside, put the political views aside, and hey, and say, hey, listen, do you have a problem with what's going on right now? Do you? Yeah? Okay, cool. Let's try to have a conversation. If, 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 it's, if it means staying after 10 o'clock at night in someone's home, have the conversation. Sleep over. Yeah. Don't sleep over. Don't sleep over. Yeah. Don't sleep over. Yeah. Go on the streets. Make some noise. Do what you got to do. But how else are we going to get out of this? That's the message I ask. And That's the question I ask. Excuse me. Yeah, no, 
and I know there's a couple of um, big promoters of um, of going after the government legally. Are you also in agreement with that? Um, I mean, it's a worth a try. Yeah. But you know, I mean, if, if, if anyone has been to court, there's ways of delaying things. Yeah. You know, and you just, I mean, I mean, as you're seeing, like what has really went through court yet? Nothing. Right. Yeah. So they're going to just keep delaying, delaying, and just keep putting in new measures and measures and measures, and people are just going to keep following. And so, I mean, do you want to wait, or do you want to just say no? I mean, and, and, and I know it's not easy. I know it's not easy. People have to go to the grocery stores. They have to get what they got to do. They're going to wear their mask. They're going to, you know, they're going to comply. I get it. I understand. But it has to start somewhere. It has to start somewhere where people have to understand that, okay, we need to say something now. Because if we don't, it's not going to get any better. Again, take it from me. We've been, the restaurant industry has done everything they've asked. And we're shut down again. It's just a matter of time until you get shut down. It's just what it is. Again, I just want to commend you for, I mean, giving that message of hope of maybe a solution to whatever we're facing. Because, again, the elections are coming up soon, and I think we have to turn the tide a bit and ask. But one second. Yeah. Before we talk about elections, yeah. because political is political. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah. I believe the people have the power. True. With whatever happens in politics, it's the people that really create the say here you cannot stop people as long as we band together we unite they could say whatever they want the people decide the markets decide that's how it always has been so you know we could we could continue to live by this whole fairy tale lifestyle but we decide we just need people that's it that's it well cheers brother cheers Good luck. Thank you. On behalf of all Montrealers. Thank so you very much. Montrealers and, uh, can, I, can I make a plug? Am I absolutely, allowed to make a plug? Yeah. yeah. Right this camera. All right. So right now we're on vacation. January, maybe February. We'll see what happens. Um, but whenever we do decide to reopen at the tequila bar, we, we, you know, we, we don't discriminate. We love everybody. Um, previous choices, future choices, whatever they may be. We love you all. Um, I believe in peace and love at, at all times and always spread love and not fear. Love always wins. Peace out.